Almost 200 years ago, Hans Christian Orsted made a discovery by accident. That discovery was probably the most important technological discoveries in the history of mankind or humankind. It says, that, he, quite simply, that electricity generates magnetism. It's as simple as that. Electricity generates magnetism. The refrigerator in your house uses that principle. The computer keyboard uses that principle. The computer itself uses that principle. Your iPhone uses that principle. Your car uses that principle in tons of different places. Just about everything we use technology-wise today uses this principle that was discovered almost 200 years ago. Electricity generates magnetism. We say electricity, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean either an electric current in a wire, or we could even mean just moving charges, although usually we're talking about a current in a wire. What does that magnetic field look like? Well, we learned yesterday that uh, the magnetic field surrounding a moving charge is always circular. Yesterday, we also learned about a couple different notations that we hadn't heard before or hadn't seen before. What does this represent? Let's say we got an electron represented by this X. What does the X exactly tell us? Yeah, it's going away from us. So in this case, we'd say it's going into the board or into the plane of the page. If this is a negative particle, we know that the, the magnetic field surrounding this negative particle moving into the plane of the page is circular. In fact, there's a series of concentric circles. Notice the spacing of these concentric circles gets further and further apart as you get further and further away from the moving charge that's causing these magnetic fields. What does that tell us? Well, that the magnetic field strength gets weaker as we get further away from the particle that's causing the field. It's only logical, right? If you've got a magnet and you get further away from that magnet, the magnetic field strength is going to get weaker. If you have a charge and you get further away from that charge, the electric field is going to get weaker. If you have a mass and you get further away from that mass, the gravitational field is going to get weaker. It seems logical to me that if you have a charge that's moving and producing a magnetic field, then that field strength is going to get weaker as you get further and further away. Therefore, we're going to represent it as field lines that are progressively further apart from each other. Now, what about the direction, though? We learned about a hand rule yesterday, a rule that we use uh, our left hand for if it's a negative particle, our right hand for if it's a positive particle. We call it the wire grasp rule, although there's lots of different names out there for it. We call it the wire grasp rule because it's kind of like grasping a wire. You stick your thumb in the direction of the moving charge. You can see in the diagram that we have here, that the charge is moving to the left, and we stick our left hand, because it's a negative particle, our thumb to the left. And our fingers, our bent fingers, how much do we bend our fingers, by the way? It doesn't matter, right? Bend your fingers just a little bit like this, bend them a lot like this, doesn't really matter, because in the end, they all point in a circle, regardless of how much you bend them. My bent fingers are going to point in the direction of the magnetic field. You guys remember that symbol, B? the magnetic field that's caused by the moving charge. Yep. Yeah, the units are Tesla, the symbol is, is B. So you can see in the diagram that we have here, we stick our thumb to the left, our fingers are gonna go around like this. Right now, my fingertips are in front of the wire, right? They're pointing down. Right now, they're behind the wire, they're pointing toward the top of the page. Right now, they're below the wire, they're pointing into the page. And right now, they're above the wire. They're pointing out of the page. A little bit easier if you have a situation like this where, I don't know, here's a negative particle again going into the page. Thumb, fingers would go counterclockwise. If we have a negative particle going out of the page, we would say thumb, fingers are going to go clockwise. If we do have those those currents pointing all along the plane of the page though, like we do here, let's say going to the left, a little bit trickier, still use the same rule though. Thumb in the direction of the particle, finger, actually that was the, the one we just did. So let's switch the direction here. Thumb to the right, fingers, right now my fingers are above the wire, right? They're pointing into the page. Right now my fingers are below the wire, they're pointing out of the page. Right now my fingers are behind the wire. They're pointing down. 
Right now my fingers are in front of the wire they're pointing up, up the page, toward the top of the page. So my magnetic field would end up going around like this. Down in the back, out, up in the front, and then towards the end of the page, away from you guys. Make sense? We had five questions for homework last night. This is the worksheet that you guys were working on in class. I want to take a look at that, that uh, worksheet now. Worksheet number 10 on page 41 of your worksheet booklet. Question number one says, draw the magnetic field surrounding the wire showing electron current uh, below here. So this is, this is like the first example we did here. Thumb in the direction of the current into the page, because that's what the X means, right, is into the page. Remember, it's like the dart going away from you versus the dot, which is the dart going towards you. It, it's going to be a circle. Fingers are going to point counterclockwise. How many people got that one? Okay. What about the next one? Uh, this is an electron current going out of the page. Thumb, fingers are going to be clockwise this time. It doesn't matter where you put your fingers, right? How much you bend your fingers. Look, here I'm bending them just a little bit. Here I'm bending them lots. Here I'm twisting my hand around a little bit. In the end, it doesn't matter. My fingers are going to go clockwise regardless of where they are, how much they're bent. Next one. This is where they get tricky. This is like the one we just did as well. Above the wire, my fingers are pointing into the page. Below the wire, my fingers point out of the page. In front of the wire, my fingers point up the page. And behind the wire, my fingers are pointing toward the bottom of the page, down the page, like this. You can write that in words, by the way, as well. I don't care if you use the notation that I've used or if you draw it or if you draw it kind of circular, if you can do that in three dimensions, or if you just write it in words. It doesn't matter. Four, find the direction of the magnetic field surrounding the moving alpha particle below. What do you notice about this question that's a little bit different than all the other questions that you've done thus far? Yeah, and that means it's positive, right? So if it's a positive particle, what do you got to do differently? Yeah, use the right-hand rule for uh, or wire grasp rule. Thumb, right thumb in the direction of the particle, which is toward the top of the page. Right now, my fingers are, don't tell me which way they're pointing. Where are they right now? To the right of it, right? Which way are they pointing now? Into the page. They're pointing into the page. This one is pointing, it's, it's to the left of the wire. It's pointing out of the page, okay? Right now, my fingers are in front of the wire, and they're pointing towards the right. Right now, my fingers are behind the wire, and they're pointing to the left, right? So we draw that one to the left. The dotted line, by the way, just means behind the wire. Good? What about the next one, number five? Diagram below shows the magnetic field surrounding a moving electron. This is kind of backwards, eh? This time, we know the direction of the field. We want to find the direction of the moving charge. It's kind of like algebra with a hand rule. Rearrange a hand rule. Instead of solving for V, maybe we rearrange V equals D over T to solve for T. Instead of solving for which way my fingers point, I know which way my fingers point. Let's solve for which way my thumb points. So let's take your thumb, so your fingers, your right hand fingers, clockwise. That means your thumb has to point which way? Has to point out of the page. So we would say the electron current is represented by that dot out of the page. The bottom one, we have an alpha particle. Be careful about that. In fact, I'd probably make a little note to remind myself that I have to use the right hand wire grasp rule for this one. Don't worry about your thumb right now. Like, let's worry about my fingers. I know when my fingers need to point clockwise. So let's make sure your fingers point clockwise. Clockwise. Thumb points in the direction of the moving charge, which is... into the page. How do we get a magnetic field that's clockwise in both cases, but yet we get opposite directions? One's a negative, one's a positive. So right hand, or sorry, left hand, thumb has to point outwards to give me a clockwise field. Right hand, thumb has to point inwards to give me a clockwise field. Is that okay? You guys want to do another one or you guys feel okay with that? Good. We talked a few minutes ago when we were reviewing this stuff about the applications and how this is certainly one of the most important technological discoveries ever made. What do you see up on the board here right now? 
Not a microphone. Without that being a it's a speaker, yeah. So it's the opposite of a microphone. All right, so we want to know how this microphone, this speaker, <laughs> how this speaker works. Um, keeping in mind that it's based on principles that we've learned here that was discovered by Orsted almost 200 years ago. Now look at what's going on here, guys. We got electrical signals going through this wire. It goes around this, looks like a loop of wire, a coil of wire there. And then what's going on? Oh, you got a permanent magnet that surrounds it. And then you have this cone that's attached to that. It's attached to this permanent magnet. And that cone is able to move. Well, how does that generate sound? Yeah, vibrations equal sound. So if you cause the cone to vibrate, to move back and forth, then what you actually do is cause uh, areas of, of high pressure and low pressure in the air, which will be transmitted via a longitudinal wave to your eardrum, which will cause your eardrum to vibrate back and forth and then produce an electrical signal in your brain. But how do we get this, this cone to vibrate the right way to produce music or to produce sound, the right sound at least? We put an electrical signal that comes from maybe a microphone, or maybe it comes from the headphone cable, the, ear, the earbud cable from your iPhone, or whatever the case may be. It's an electrical signal. Okay, we don't send sound through wire. We send electricity through a wire. That electricity is proportional to the sound that, you, that your phone wants to generate, or that your stereo system wants to generate, but it's not sound. As that electricity goes through the wire and, gets, and it gets transferred to this coil of wire here, it generates a magnetic field. That magnetic field varies depending upon the electrical signal at any given moment. So the electrical signal will vary depending upon what sound we want to get out of the other end. As it varies, the magnetic field that it generates varies. That magnetic field interacts with this magnetic field that's caused by this permanent magnet. And then we get either attraction or repulsion, depending upon which way that magnetic field points. Now, we've got this cone that's attached to this permanent magnet that is effectively attracted or repelled by the electromagnet that I've just made, and then it goes in and out. So as the electrical signal varies, the magnetic field strength generated by that electrical signal varies which causes the repulsion or attraction to vary, which causes the cone to go in or out. How is this based on what we just learned? Fundamentally, if this wire doesn't generate a magnetic field, none of this happens. So you don't get to listen to music unless it's live, a cappella, live, no microphones, no sound system. You don't get to listen to that. Um, unless you have this discovery, okay? Another one. What do you see up there? Let's flip the lights off for this one because it's kind of hard to see. Could be a fire alarm, could be a, could be a, could be a doorbell, okay? It's something that goes ding, 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 as long as the switch is activated. So how does this one work? This is kind of ingenious, actually. I like this one. The switch up here right now is open. That means that there's no electric current flowing. When we close the switch, then the electric current starts flowing from this battery. By the way, this would be the negative end of the battery. This would be the positive end of the battery. So the electrons would start flowing this way. They'd start flowing through this, this thing that we call a make or break contact, which right now is made. I don't know if you can see this, but there's a little wire or there's a little piece of steel that that uh, is in contact with this make or break contact. So we get electrons going through here, through this make or break contact, through this, through this, through this, around here, around here, back down here, and back around, right? It's a complete circuit. So electrons flow. Now, what do you think happens as the electrons go through this coil of wire and this coil of wire? generates a magnetic field. Listen, it generates a magnetic field everywhere where the current is flowing, but it gets magnified here and here because the wire keeps wrapping around. So we end up getting more of an effect there, more of a magnetic field produced there. This magnetic field that's caused by this wire that has a current going through it, which remember is Orsted's discovery, right? Moving charges generate magnetic fields. 
This magnetic field, field attracts this thing. It's a piece of steel. It attracts it. And as it attracts it, it pull, gets pulled over to the right like this towards it. What happens to this hammer? Hits the bell. What do you hear? Ding. ding. That's it, though. You hear one ding. Now what happens? Look, this make-break contact is now, is now broken because this piece of steel that was over here is now over here, and this other piece of steel that was in contact with the make-break contact is over here. The contact is broken. Now there's no electric current flowing through there because you don't have a complete circuit. So now what happens? Matt, what happens? The magnetic effect disappears. Right? There's no electromagnet anymore because you don't have a current flowing. This spring right here pulls this back, makes contact. Current starts flowing again. Electromagnets attract it. Hammer hits the bell. Ding. Breaks contact, goes back, and so on and so on and so on. If the frequency of this is 60 hertz, which is the frequency of the electricity in your house, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, 60 hertz, um, then you would get this ringing, ding, 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 60 times per second. If you set the frequency of this switch at 20 hertz, then you would hear ding, 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 20 dings per second. However, Whatever your frequency is at, however quickly you're closing and opening that switch, is the rate at which you hear the ding. Make sense? Again, based on the fire alarm in the school is based on the principles that Orsted discovered 198 years ago. Electricity generates magnetism. Without that, we don't have a fire alarm. Good. There's almost an infinite number of applications for this, right? Almost an infinite number of applications. We could go on and on and on. Bottom line is just about everything uses this somewhere inside it, this discovery. Okay, you got a few multiple choice questions that I want to work on here. The first one is multiple choice number 66, and that's going to appear at the end, close to the end of your booklets. All right, let's have a look here. Um, this question says, given the magnetic fields illustrated above, the magnets will repel in which diagrams? Uh, when you look at this for the first time, you think, like, listen, we don't even have any poles. Like, it doesn't even say what's North Pole and what's South Pole. Clearly, there's magnetic poles. We just don't know what they are. We've got a couple of options here. We can figure out what north, what's North and what's South, and then say North repels North and South repels South, and figure it out that way. But we don't actually have to do that. Anybody think of a way to answer this question without actually identifying what's a north and what's a south? Yeah, Betty? Okay, so what do you mean looking at the lines? Okay, so what about the field lines? Okay, so if they join up, then what happens? Okay, good. If they don't join up, then they're going to repel. So let's look at that. All right, these ones, do these ones join up? Yeah, these ones join up in the middle here, so we're going to get a force of attraction there. Do these ones join up in number two? No, none of those field lines join up, so they're going to repel. What about these ones? Yeah, so they're going to attract. And what about these ones? They're going to repel. So it would be two and four that are going to repel. The answer would be D, two and four. Now, if you did have to identify what was north and what was south, we'd, we'd identify this is south, this is north. We'd identify this is south, this is North, field lines go away from the north and toward the south, right? We don't have to do that, but another question, we might have to do that. So that's how you do it. Take a look at the next one, number 68, please. Okay, what are we getting for this one? Direction of the magnetic field at point P due to the two bar magnets is what? Um, there's a couple strategies we could follow for this one. Uh, the one that I find some people like to try is kind of like this. They, uh, the field line goes from north to south like this. Well, if that's the case, then the field at this point P points diagonally up and to the right. I don't like that one as much, to be honest, but it'll work. Okay? The way that I would prefer to do this question is to look at each magnet independently of one another. So pretend this one's not there. 
The field strength or the field direction caused by the bottom magnet is going to be this way, away from the north. Let's pretend that one doesn't exist now. The field caused by the second magnet is going to be this way, toward the south. Well, what is the combined field? When we have one that's to the right and one's up, it's going to be up and to the right. So either way you look at it, the magnetic field is going to be represented by D. How many people did it the first way? Yeah, how many people did it the second way? Okay, about half and half. They both work. Uh, I just find, I just think that this is a little bit more versatile. If, if, you, if you have a pattern that's a little bit more confusing, I think it's easier to draw them one by one than it is to try to combine them like we did the first time. Got another one. Number 69, which is uh, maybe next page, um, has some compasses surrounding a wire here. Now, it doesn't photocopy real clear, so I just got to explain something about this, right? These compasses all have compass needles pointing out. They try to draw this in three dimension, but it's meant to be out of the page. Okay, we want to know which compass is correct, which compass is pointing in the right direction, if the wire carries electrons through the wire. Two things that we got to kind of catch in this one, right? Two things that we got to know. One, compasses point in the direction of a magnetic field. Two, how do you find the direction of a magnetic field that surrounds a wire with a current going through it? Well, let's deal with the second one first. Let's say we got electrons moving toward the top of the page. Let's stick my left thumb toward the top of the page. Where, where are my fingers right now? Don't tell me where they're pointing. Where are they? To the right of the wire. Which way are they pointing, Connor? Towards us, right. Okay. So it looks like the magnetic field should point out of the page to the right. That looks right, doesn't it? Looks like I nailed it on the first try. Okay. Looks like that's right, but let's just double check the rest of them, okay? At position four, in front of the wire, which way do my fingertips point? To the left. Is that pointing to the left? That's no, pointing out on the page. So that doesn't work because the compass needs to point to the left in the direction of the field. Uh, position one, to the right of the wire, sorry, to the left of the wire. So my fingers are pointing to the left. That's pointing uh, out of the page. So that doesn't work. What about position number one here? Uh, fingers are to the left. They're pointing into the page. That doesn't work because it's pointing out of the page. Position two there. Position two is behind the wire. Fingers are pointing to the right. Got our compass pointing towards the, well, out of the page there, so that doesn't work. Looks like number three is the only one that can possibly work. This is the magnetic field that surrounds that. That's a really poor 3D diagram. But you get the idea that position three is the only one that has the compass pointing in the correct direction. What's our answer there? Uh, C. Good? Yes. All right. We've got some questions for you to work on. On page 592. We're going to do questions 6 to 16 on page 592.